Patient data registered. Alan Dega. Platinum class confirmed. Loss of blood, 35%. I suggest reversible death. Okay. After a severe accident or heart attack, every second brings us closer to death. So wouldn't it be great if one day we could somehow stop the clock? In the future, EMT crews could use a technique called reversible death or suspended animation. They will replace your blood with an ice-cold saline solution, dropping your body temperature to below 50 degrees Fahrenheit. At that point, brain and heart activity come to a halt. And that's not the only blood substitute that one day could save your life. 50 years from now, we'll have cures for trauma victims that would seem like miracles today. Your left thigh has been fractured and your hip is dislocated. Two ribs and a second lumbar vertebra are also fractured, but you have a bigger problem. Your artificial heart has fissures. You're going to open me up? You need a new heart. The print's already in progress. It'll only take another 20 hours. Iris scan identified. Marie Balzac. Status cleared for security zone. Have a nice evening. In this high security area, gene specialists have processed the patient's tissue sample. Now they are using it to print a heart. If your car gets banged up because you're in a car accident, what do you do? You go to the body shop and get a new door or fender. But if you happen to be in that same accident, you could die. Now, consider this. In the United States alone, there are 91,000 patients waiting for an organ transplant. And of them, 18 die every day for an organ that never comes. What we need is a human body shop. And in 50 years' time, tissue engineering could change everything. A child today with a defective heart valve has limited options. Valves from animals don't last long, and artificial valves can cause clots. Stephen Jakenhuvel wants to avoid these problems by implanting the world's first heart valve grown exclusively from the body's own tissue. Within an hour, he has the rough form of a heart valve, which he places in a bioreactor. Next, he adds nutrients and cells which normally line heart valve walls. The cells latch onto the structure and start to grow. Within just three weeks, a complete heart valve has formed. Finally, a pump exercises the valve to strengthen its walls so it can withstand the high pressures in a human heart. Patient hypotherm. During surgery, doctors won't have to touch the patient. Body temperature 46 degrees. Blood completely replaced with plasma solution. Instead, surgeons will manipulate a 3D model of the body. These virtual images will revolutionize surgery in the next decades. With a click, doctors can switch from a scalpel to a saw. They open the thorax virtually, while robotic arms perform the actual incisions. Are all the main arteries blocked? Yes, you can remove the organ. Well, this is just a taste, just the beginning of what you're going to find in physics of the future. What else you're going to find is the question of immortality. Is it possible that we can live forever? Is it possible that we can be 30 years of age and cruise, cruise at 30 years of age for the rest of your natural life? 
What about the question of immortality? What about starships? What about going to the stars? What about the future of space travel? So these are just some of the things that I touch in the book, Physics of the Future. Can we have the lights now? So if you go in the book, you'll see that we talk about the future of computers, robots. What will a robot look like? The future of the economy. And I'll answer the question, who will have a job in the future? Are you going to have a job in the future? Well, buy my book and you'll find out whether you're going to have a job in the future, okay? So I'll be signing books in a minute, but let me just end on one final story. I owe a tremendous debt to a role model that I had as a child. Every time, sometimes I get discouraged, I think of what he went through. That role model was Albert Einstein. And let me tell you this Einstein story. When Einstein was an old man, he was tired of giving the same talk over and over again. So one day his chauffeur came up to him and his chauffeur said, Einstein, Professor Einstein, I'm a chauffeur, but I'm also a part-time actor. I've heard your speech so many times I've memorized it. So why don't we switch places? I will put on a mustache and a wig. I'll be the great Einstein and you can take a rest to be my chauffeur. So they switched places and it worked beautifully. Einstein got a great rest. But then, one day, a mathematician in the back asked the chauffeur a very difficult question. And Einstein thought, oh, the game is up. But then the chauffeur said, that question is so elementary that even my chauffeur here can answer it for you. <laughs> Thank you very much. You've been a great audience. So I'll take uh, a few questions, and then I'll be more than happy to sign copies of the book. Once again, it'll be excerpted in the New York Post this weekend. After this, I'm uh, sorry I have to leave a little early. I'll be on Nightline tonight and Good Morning America tomorrow morning. But let's take a few questions from the audience. Yes? Er, yeah? Yeah. Well, when I was in high school, I had a mentor who guided me and actually arranged for me to get a scholarship to Harvard where I began my scientific career. He was one of the founders of nuclear power. He was actually the father of the hydrogen bomb. My mentor was Edward Teller. So I got to know Edward Teller quite well. And Edward Teller loved nuclear energy. He thought we would all have reactors everywhere, but he knew how dangerous they were. And so I'll never forget what he told me. He said, nuclear power does not belong on the surface of the earth. It belongs underground. It is so dangerous, it is so volatile, that if it's underground and you have a meltdown, what do you do? You put a manhole cover on it. If in Japan we had nuclear power plants that were underground, then today all they would have to do after a tsunami is put the manhole cover on. Instead, we may have to evacuate northern Japan. You probably heard the latest, and that is workers may have to be evacuated pretty soon. And when the workers are evacuated, the reactor is in free fall, free fall, and we'll have meltdowns in four reactors simultaneously. So I'll discuss this tonight on Nightline. But anyway, let's take a few questions, yeah? Okay, so the question is, what will this technology do to our bodies, and what about the waste produced by this technology? This is called human tissue engineering. Already we are gradually being able to reproduce from your own cells most of the organs of your body. Now we're doing the complex ones. The next will be the liver. And we hope to even do the brain at some point. We won't be able to replace the brain, but we will be able to inject stem cells into the brain have them incorporate themselves into the living brain, and we'll be able to reverse Parkinson's maybe, or maybe even Alzheimer's. Also, we'll be able to extend the lifespan. The aging process is now being unraveled. This is huge. We've identified 60 genes that control the aging process. 
we now more or less know why you die. The question is, can we stop the clock? The answer is no. But we now know what aging is. Aging is entropy. Aging is disorder, chaos. Every time the cell divides, it picks up a little bit of disorder, mutations, junk. That's why we age. But the cell has repair mechanisms. For example, a car. Where does aging take place in a car? Well, the engine, right? The engine has carbon deposits. It has oxidation, wear and tear. What is the engine of a cell? The mitochondria, the power plant of a cell. We now know where aging takes place. And if we can reinforce uh, repair mechanisms, we could then stop the clock. This is one of three methods now being looked at by scientists who now believe for the first time in, in human history that we can now see a possibility of perhaps living maybe almost forever. Uh, yeah. <clears throat> Two more. Yeah. Okay. Um. I really like the idea of having embedded chips monitor your health uh, and thereby lifestyle. However, am I right to assume that safeguarding such information is the next top career field? Yes. Uh, with, this inf with all this information going up on the Internet, we're going to have to find ways to stop this information from going in the hands of petty thieves. You know, before I wrote, I wrote this book, I read Brave New World. Brave New World is what everyone feared, Big Brother. The Internet might have become Big Brother, might have. But in 1989, something that happened that changed everything in 1989. First, the Soviet bloc broke up. Second, the National Science Foundation saw that the Internet was no longer necessary as a military weapon. So what did the National Science Foundation do in 1989 that changed world history? It gave it away for free. A technology that could have become like 1984 was given away for free by the National Science Foundation. Today it's everywhere. If President Obama tries to stop the Internet, the reaction would be laughter. So if the Internet is so powerful, what's the problem? The problem is not Big Brother. The problem is Little Brother. Nosy busybodies, petty thieves, criminals. Little brother is the problem. So why don't we create software programs to protect us against Nigerian scam artists? Because there's no money in it yet. If you're a software writer and you make software, who do you want to work for? Apple, because that's where the big bucks are. The big bucks are in software that makes things that kids want. Kids want the latest in everything. Kids are not necessarily interested in stopping Nigerian scams. However, eventually, there'll be so many scams on the Internet, the software designers will start to make real solid safeguards to protect us. Okay, So give it a few years until it becomes profitable for software designers to make these things, and then we'll be protected from Little Brother. Okay, one more question. Doctor, good evening. Thank you for coming here tonight. With all the advances that we have seen on the Discovery Channel that you often speak and write about with the creation of uh, human uh, tissue and advancement like that, is anything occurring, Doctor, now or in the very near future with regard to in utero detection and reversal of things such as CP, such as autism, with this great uh, ability that we have to detect disease and to assist with assistive technology with older people. What is happening in utero, doctor, to detect things like autism? Thank you. Well, the problem is not really detection. The problem is we don't know what these diseases are. It's even more fundamental. We're very good at detecting things because physicists are the ones who sequence the DNA. It was Francis Crick, a physicist. It was a physicist who worked out how to read the DNA in mass that was Walter Gilbert, another physicist. So identifying genes, identifying illnesses, that's very easy. The problem is we don't...